Thanks, and thanks, Leslie, for this uh, illuminating talk for everybody who didn't know anything about olfaction. I hope now you've seen your radar. Um, and I hope also that after the session with uh, the results of the olfaction challenge, you, you, you will see how uh, learning from new um, biological questions and marrying that with the computational biology can give an amazing uh, result, as you will see in the challenge. So I'm going to present Andreas, who's uh, um, basically faulty for us uh, all being here. Uh, I gave a talk at Rockefeller on Dream, and uh, he contacted me right away and said, well, we have to do this challenge about olfaction. Um, having been a student at Rockefeller, I was also contaminated with all the neuroscience that's being done there and the genetic basis of perception. Um, and, and I was right away thrilled uh, by that. Uh, it's, we, we really, the, one of the first things we always do in Dream is try to check the data and see if there's, uh, you know, anything that can come out uh, of it. And, uh, and actually this challenge was amazing by the quality and the results that we could get uh, out of it. So you will see that is actually really, really impressive because uh, initially the idea of trying to predict what people are going to percept just based on structures uh, of molecules and of, of course, some training data from, from the actual person seemed to be like a really long shot, uh, basically seeing a human as a total, um, you know, black box. So uh, Andreas has, uh, I guess, this uh, marriage of interest. Uh, I've known him for a few years, uh, bumping to him uh, in the New York subway late, late at night and uh, also at Rockefeller. He has a uh, different sets of interest. He, thought she just got, um, he has been uh, with Leslie for a few years uh, uh, and uh, now also received a PhD in philosophy. And he wrote his dissertation on the philosophy of olfaction. Uh, we hope that uh, that book will be published soon and, and uh, it probably will be very interesting. So Andreas, please join us. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. No, no philosophy today, don't worry. Um, so after the, the Leslie's introduction to smell in general, I'm gonna focus it a little more now on the dream challenge. And so I'm gonna have four parts. I'm gonna become pretty clear about the question again, then briefly look at previous work, talk for most of it about the actual data and then like look at what to expect, the scoring and some of the limitations, many of which have already been mentioned. So the question again is what is the relation between the physical chemical properties of molecules and its olfactory qualities perceived by humans. So as Leslie pointed out, this question has been nicely um, answered or is much better understood in other modalities because of the low dimensionality. So light, for example, in color vision um, has two dimensions. It has an amplitude and a wavelength. And then the color we perceive has three dimensions. That's the hue, saturation, and brightness. And so you have a two on three kind of mapping. And you probably don't need a dream challenge to figure out how to map two things on three things. In smell, we don't know all those things. If you look at molecules, they have different numbers of atoms. They have different types of atoms. Those atoms are at different positions. So there's like many, many, many things that are different between different molecules. And the same is true on the side of the perceptual space, that there are many, many things that can be different between two smells that are perceived. So this is why this is a good thing for a challenge like this for people that are a little um, more skilled at dealing with that than us are part of. So previous work, there's a lot known about how the structure of a molecule influences the smell of a molecule, but much of it is just like anecdotal and like expert witness. So if you like, you know, show to an experienced perfumer some kind of molecular structure, you probably have a pretty good guess, some kind of new structure that the perfumer has never smelled before, he or she may be able to guess with um, above random accuracy how that molecule will smell. If you show me a molecule and it has a sulfur atom in it, I'm going to guess it smells like garlic or fish. 
and I have a pretty good chance of being right about that. So all those things are out there, but the problem is they are not quantitative, right? It's like they usually smell like fish when they have sulfur in it, but you know, not all of them. And so our attempt was to like take this kind of distributed, um, non-quantitative, non-verifiable knowledge about it and try to make quantitative models. Um, and there has been a couple, um, a little work on this in the last 10 years or so, mainly on pleasantness. So these are two papers um, that go at predicting pleasantness. Here's the third one. And so you see the kind of thing that, that we would hope to get. So if you look down here, the results suggest that larger molecules contain oxygen are more likely to perceived as pleasant, while the opposite applies to the acids and sulfur compounds. So people know that, you know, nobody who knows about smell will be surprised about that statement. But then you have a, um, an equation below that that will actually predict quantitatively how pleasant the molecule will be. And then you have something where you can tell how good are you and how um, the relative impact of these three or four features of the molecule on the pleasantness is. So these are really the main examples of quantitative things. Um, <coughs> I've never seen a paper that tries to quantitatively predict something more complex like how fishy or flowery smells and odors. So we are just the first to do that as far as I know. And the same is true for intensity. Okay, so the data, Natalie has shown the photo, so it's pretty um, low tech, the bottles and people smelling them. And then we have a computer screen with a custom written app where they will give their opinions on those odors. Questions we ask them, first we ask, can you smell anything? If they say no, then they move on to the next odor. If they say yes, they're gonna be asked how strong is the smell. So this is the intensity, how pleasant is the smell, this is the valence, and then how much do those 19 descriptors apply to them. And the way it's answered is that people have a slider on their screen and they can slide it from not at all to exactly like um, fruit or something like that. And then we just divide the position of that slider um, into a hundred bins, so we get a scale from one to a hundred for all of those. And you see the descriptors, it's not, um, I mean, as I said, it's the first time ever to try something like that for the descriptors, but it's not overly ambitious, right? It's like, how much does it smell like a flower and how much does it smell like a fruit, not how much does it smell like a rose and how much does it smell like a pineapple. So the molecules we use, this is one of my favorite quotes. We are creating a science of olfaction based on cinnamon and coffee. So there's a lot of things in there. Three things are in there, I believe. One thing that's in there is that you know, a lot of odor molecules, as Leslie suggested, um, very few are being studied and a lot of conclusions are based on pretty much the same sets of few odors and it's always a good idea to just like get more odors in there. It's also a good idea to get more diverse odors in there. So a lot of the information about this comes from industry and perfumers and um, flavor industry like cinnamon and coffee. This points at what the flavor industry would be interested in and would study. And so there's all these other odors uh, that smell like chemical or slightly unpleasant or whatever. And those don't get studied usually because they don't have that potential payoff of helping perfumers and flavorists. So the second thing in this quote is that one should expand the diversity of the odors one studies. The third thing that's in there is that cinnamon and coffee are like, you know, they are landmark odors, people can smell it, they have a word for it, and it's exactly that smell. 
And so they are very familiar and very easily to recognize. And what one should try to do is bring in unfamiliar odors because Leslie said culture contaminates the odor perception. So what you would want to have is, you know, a person who never has smelled any odor before and ask them about their opinions to get away from that cultural influence. In the absence of being able to do that, it's nice to use odors where people go like, I don't really know what it smells like. I don't have the word for it because then you won't have associations with the odor that influence you. And so we tried to do that. So we took 480 different molecules for this um, challenge. That is, you know, not the largest number ever, but it, for studies that looked at this, it is a very large number. The usual, the data set that's most frequently used for stuff like that is the Drufnik's Odor Atlas, which I think is, has 140 different molecules. And then that stuff to the right of it doesn't really matter all that much. It's just supposed to show that they are diverse, that's different, that different features of odors are well represented in that. And we tried to um, get our hands on some odors that don't have easily recognizable uh, smells. So um, those are that's the selection of the odors we use. The subjects, our subjects are untrained. They're pretty diverse, as you can see, men and women, um, good mix of the races and the ages. A lot of the odor databases are based on professionals of the flavor industry's opinion, and that's a very self-selected and non-diverse group. So this is also something that we are um, consciously wanted to have to like capture the diversity that we talked about so much, the diversity in odor perception we talked so much about earlier. So to summarize again, the goal would be many and chemically diverse chemicals Many of those who don't have strong associations, so you can dissociate between perception and judgment and diverse untrained subjects. So now the actual data, um, of course not the, oh, we tested each of the 480 molecules at two different concentrations, I should say. Um, not the actual data, but like, you know, some two slides on some of the data. So when you just look at what those people, how they moved that slider, you can just look at your thousand stimuli. So it came up to a thousand stimuli total um, and can see which one is the most pleasant one and the least pleasant one. And here are the three winners for that. And so you see that the two concentrations of vanillin and ethyl vanillin are the three most pleasant stimuli for those people and the least pleasant ones are all acids. Um, so these are histograms of the distribution of the ratings of the people. So this is a reassuring um, result because, because I personally agree that the left ones smell good and the right ones smell bad. Um, and then you can look at those uh, verbal descriptors we used and can also look like which one is the odor that correlates the strong, or that has the strongest rating for these descriptors. And again, this is reassuring. So vanillin is the strongest for being sweet and being bakery, which makes a lot of sense. And then, you know, grass is the strongest for grass is cis hexanol which is the, you know, what they sell you when they sell you grass odor, if you ever want to buy grass odor. So you can get this kind of descriptive data of how the population perceives odors out of that. But of course we need more, right? I said, remember the, um, the goal is to correlate those perception, the, the data from the perception with data about the molecules. So we gave just um, compound IDs, which are numbers that um, identify each molecule, and people could 
come up with any kind of information about the molecules they could find, um, which is easy. There are databases online and so on. But also for people who didn't want to get into trying to figure out how to best describe a molecule themselves, we provided a list of a little over 4,000 descriptors for each of the molecules that's calculated by this um, commercial program, Dragon by Talidi, that's the company. So this is usually used for drug discovery, and it's a lot of descriptors of what you can say about a molecule, and that there are almost 5,000 um, tells you that it's difficult to find out what's important about a molecule and that it's difficult to find any set of descriptors that would fully describe a molecule. Just got an email this week that they come out with version 7, which has an additional, I forgot, but has even more descriptors, right? So maybe the new ones were the important ones. Okay, so now we have like the data that we generated um, uh, on the perceptual side, and we have every data that people can find somewhere, plus the Talidi that we gave on the physical chemical side. And then the thing is, correlate these, explain one using the other. And so what I show here is correlation coefficients between um, the descriptors being assigned and the, um, and the a descriptor for the molecule and you see the number of sulfur atoms is the best at predicting that something smells like garlic fish decayed. The carboxylic acids are the best at predicting that something is sweaty and the esters are something are best at predicting something is fruity which again is something everybody could tell you because fruity molecules are esters and so on. Um, and, but this is as far as we are able to do that and why we needed all of you guys to do that challenge to go beyond just doing this idiotic set of correlations from the 5,000 descriptors to the 21, um, 21 measures that we came up with. Okay, what to expect? So here I just wanted to do a different spin on the topic that's already been discussed, so perception versus judgment. Some people you talk to would tell you that pleasantness isn't perceived at all. Leslie cited um, this idea that babies don't really discriminate pleasantness of odors. So it can't be, if that's true, it can't be in the structure of the molecule, right? If for babies everything is pleasant, and then only because you get sick after eating something or your parents yell at you when you, you know, pick something up from the ground, only then you develop this dimension of pleasantness of odors, then it can't be in the structure of the molecule, right? Because the molecule structure doesn't change between you being a baby and you being a grown up. So this is just supposed to say that one point of this challenge is if there's something at all, right? Is there a correlation at all? Or is, for example, pleasantness just a cultural construct? And so one would never expect a 100% prediction because there is at least this component. And also for some of the um, other descriptors, like there's warm and cold. So this is clearly a metaphor. These are temperatures. All the odors have the same temperature, they are not warm and cold. So it kind of feels you don't really perceive that, but you more judge it upon smelling that. There are other descriptors like garlic, where you could say, yeah, well, maybe you perceive that because you have a garlic reference and you perceive similarity to it. Um, then the data is noisy. I'm just saying this like compared to sequencing data or something like that, probably. Um, there's a lot of noise in psychophysics data and this data set because it's untrained subjects because we're interested in the variability is extremely noisy. So here you see two um, um, odors at two dilutions, low and high, and so all the lines should go down, right? It should get weaker and weaker the more you dilute it, but then I 
color two here in orange that go up, that shouldn't be the case. So this means we haven't tested enough people or there's something going on here, a, a, a sequence effect or something. So the data is noisy and you wouldn't also expect 100% even if your model is perfectly right. Okay, so like to, to wrap all that up together, um, what did did those things lead us to want from people? We wanted two sub-challenges, one for individual subjects and one for the um, population of subjects we had because of what we discussed earlier, that we are really cutting out the middleman, which are the odor end receptors, which would be a great other dream challenge to predict those things. So we are cutting that out and if some people think androstadienone is sweet and other think it smells like urine and other things it smells like nothing, you can't predict how it smells to people based on the structure. But you can predict how it smells to a single individual because there you know they have the same set of odor and receptors. So that's why we needed two sub-challenges, the upper one for individual subjects and the lower one for the average. And then we divided it, each of the sub-challenges in three, intensity and pleasantness, and then the matrix of the 19 descriptors. And in sub-challenge two, we also added the, are you telling me something or is this a technical? Okay, sub-challenge two, we add, add the standard deviation, which is the variability. So this is also good in all other data sets, people try by training their people and by, you know, um, making, making sure to exclude, like they want a consensus on how an odor smells. We didn't want a consensus. We were interested in the variability as itself and therefore sub-challenge two also has standard deviations. And then they were scored by just taking the C scores for those three things, for one, um, intensity, pleasantness and the matrix and for sub-challenge to the C scores for the six. So that would be, again, intensity, pleasantness, matrix, but this time the average and the standard deviation. And Peggy did all the work. Thank you.